Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Uh, today we will talk about one particular mechanical device, pendulum, uh, which everybody saw many times, I'm sure. Um, but we will investigate how this particular mechanical device is working, what are the laws which govern uh, its behavior, its parameters, whatever. Um, and uh, we will approach it strictly, mathematically, physically correct as far as we can do it. Um, now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on uh, unisor.com website, together with some other courses, uh, for instance, Math for Teens, um, and U.S. Law for Teens, and some others. So all these courses are completely free, there are no advertisements, so I do recommend you to watch this lecture and any other actual lecture of this and other courses from the website, because for every lecture there is a very detailed notes, and the lectures are arranged in certain logical sequence to make it a course. So whatever we are doing right now, Physics for Teens, that's a relatively complete course of physics for uh, high school level students which starts with mechanics and ends with whatever pictures of atoms or whatever. Anyway, um, so let's talk about pendulum. Today we'll talk about pendulum. Very simple device. Everybody knows what it is. So we will define it as follows. We have um, certain vertical and when I'm saying a vertical it means we are on the planet like this planet Earth, for instance, and the vertical is obviously the direction towards the center of the Earth, because this is the source of gravity. And the force of gravity is the main force participating in the oscillation of the pendulum. Now, at some point, we fixed one end of the uh, thread, and at another end, we put some kind of a weight. This is a point object, which means it has a zero dimension and certain mass, let's say mass is m. Now the uh, thread has certain lengths, obviously uh, we will call it L. And um, the way how we will operate this particular um, uh, pendulum, which sometimes is called mathematical pendulum because it's really an abstraction. This is not really a point, obviously, object. This is some real object. and. Whenever we are talking about real parameters, everything is changing. But right now we are talking about ideal mathematical pendulum, which is, this is the point object of certain mass. And what we do is we will uh, tilt it by angle phi from, uh, from the vertical, all right? And let it go. Our question is, what will happen? Well, I mean, we all know what will happen in the qualitative sense of this word. It will start oscillating back and forth, back and forth, and considering this is mathematical pendulum, which means uh, we ignore completely air resistance, some kind of a friction in this thread, etc. Thread is considered to be non-stretchable, obviously. Uh, so it will indefinitely make these oscillating movements. So now the question is, how we can really say what kind of quantitative parameters of this movement. Um, again, intuitively, it's probably obvious it will go from the uh, angle phi to the right to angle phi to the left and then back and forth, back and forth. We are probably mostly interested in the period of these um, oscillations. And actually, what's probably the most important characteristic of this movement is this function phi of t. Now, this is angle probably should be uh, um, symbolized as phi zero, which means it's an initial um, angle of tilting this uh, particular thing. But as the angle, this angle, is changing with the time, this basically defines the movement of this uh, pendulum. So that's our purpose, to find out this function. Okay. Now, um, we should actually impose certain initial conditions because, as you know, lots of mechanical uh, motions can be expressed using whatever the laws of physics are, like, for instance, 
uh, Newton's second law can be e expressed in some kind of differential equations and to solve differential equations we need uh, initial conditions. So what kind of initial conditions we can impose on this particular function uh, phi of t? Well, first of all, obviously phi of 0 is equal to initial angle, right? So that's at the moment uh, t is equal to 0 because we have tilted and then let it go. Now, the fact that we let it go, it means we didn't push it in any direction. Now, pushing is something like initial speed or whatever. I mean, then it goes by itself, but initially we can push it, but we didn't. So we have to somehow specify that we didn't really push it. Now, what does it mean that we didn't really push it? It means that linear, this is trajectory, right? So the linear speed of this point object at the end of the thread initially is zero. That's basically what it means we don't really push it. So there is an initial speed along this orbit and it's zero. Now, how can I express linear speed along the trajectory on a circle? Now, this is obviously a circle, right? Since this is a thread. So how can I express in terms of function phi of t that the linear speed along this trajectory initially is equal to zero? So how speed along the circular trajectory can be expressed in terms of the angle. Well, very simply, as we know, the length of the um, arc is always equal to radius times angle, right? So if you have an arc, this is angle alpha in radians, obviously, this is radius r. So this length is r times alpha. Okay, so we know that which means our linear uh, displacement is equal to L times phi of t. Linear displacement from the beginning to position at moment t. Now, the derivative of this is my linear speed. L is a constant, so it's a derivative of phi of t. So that's my linear speed in terms of angular displacement and the radius L of this, um, of this thread. Which means that I can say that my, at moment zero, is equal to zero. That's what it means. And now we don't really need L because it's a constant. So this is the second initial condition. So the function phi of t has two initial conditions. One on its value at point t equals 0. Another value of its derivative at point uh, t equals 0. So the uh, tilt is equal to, initial tilt is equal to phi 0. Initial speed is equal to 0. Okay. Now let's talk about what kind of... Um, equation um, we can impose on the movement of this particular object. Well, what kind of forces are, um, uh, uh, are we are dealing with right now? Well, obviously the first and most important force is the weight, right? This is mass of this object M times acceleration of the free-falling. Probably we're talking about planet Earth, so G is 9.8 meters per second square. Mass is whatever the mass is. That's the most important point, the uh, most important force which is acting. And as we are considering, let's say, initial condition like this, uh, what actually forces this particular uh, point object to still be at length L from this point and at the same time to move along the uh, circular orbit, circular trajectory. Well, very simply, what we have to do is we have to um, represent my uh, weight as um, a superposition of two uh, forces. One going 
uh, along the along the thread and now they're going perpendicularly to the thread so this would be R and this would be F so basically my weight is equal to a combination of function F plus uh, R. Now, this point is always at the length L, which means that um, this component, the R, it's not stretching because the thread is not stretchable, which means that there is a reaction force, R0, or whatever one we call it, which is exactly equal to the uh, component R, but directed in the opposite direction and they are balancing each other. This is the reason why this point object is always on a constant length L from the uh, point where the thread is fixed. And this component is the main component which actually forces our object to move along the circular trajectory. Now, obviously, this is angle phi, now this is also, now we can actually talk about phi, not phi zero. So it's some kind of a position in between. So this is also angle phi. So my function, my, my, um, uh, my component uh, f is equal to uh, pi times, uh, this is phi, this is phi sine. So this is mg times sine of phi of t at any moment t uh, so th it means that this particular force is changing um, in both direction because it's always uh, tangential to a, uh, to a circle and in magnitude because phi uh, of t is changing in magnitude now this uh, component r um, it, it's uh, um, correspondingly is equal to mg times cosine of phi of t, also changing in direction because we are moving, so the r is directing this way or this way or this way, and it's also uh, changing in magnitude depending on phi. And we can actually completely ignore this uh, uh, force R, we don't really need it. We need really only one force, which is the one which basically forces our pendulum to, to go along this circular object. And since we know the force, we, we can um, put together a second law, Newton's second law, because acceleration along this particular orbit we can definitely express in terms of uh, function phi of t, right? So we were already talking that the uh, uh, the velocity uh, is is the first um, derivative from the l times phi of t. L times phi of t is basically the distance traveled. Uh, until the, uh, until the angle becomes uh, phi of t during the time t, so this is the first derivative. So this is basically um, absolute value of the velocity, and uh, the second derivative will be this one again because l is a constant. So the second derivative is um, acceleration along the circular. Um, trajectory. So at any moment of time, this force course I I is the cause of this acceleration of this particular object. So let's just express it as a uh, second law, Se Newton's second law. This is my force. Now this is acceleration, so we have to multiply mass times acceleration to get the force, right? So it's mass times acceleration L 
times phi second derivative of t. They must be equal to each other. However, I would like to make um, one very important note here. As the angle is diminishing, force is always acting towards diminishing of this angle, right? So whatever the uh, position phi of t at any moment, then the force goes, th go go goes this way and it's trying to diminish this angle, right? So uh, the force must be with a minus sign, otherwise it will not it, uh, uh, otherwise this thing will not be a, a true uh, uh, e equation. So that's very important. The force is towards decreasing the function, uh, this, the, the, the function phi of t. So that's why we are always talking about uh, diminishing um, its, uh, it, it, its speed and diminishing its acceleration. So that's why acceleration is always negative in this particular case. It's always towards diminishing of the angle. And what's another very important thing is this, m, m, which means what? Which means that our equation and correspondingly the function phi of t is independent, is independent of mass. So it doesn't really matter how big how heavy this particular object is. Uh, the heavy pendulum will have exactly the same um, type of oscillation as the light one. It will do in sync. So if you will just take two pendulums like this, one with a uh, heavy um, uh, point object, another with a light one, and just uh, tilt it at the same angle and let it go at the same time, they will do synchronously oscillations. So the function phi of t, it's a solution to this differential equation and m, mass, does not participate. So all we have to do is to solve this particular differential equation. So let me just write it here. I will do it something like this. Okay, this is our differential equation. And solution to this equation is our function phi of t, which we are trying to determine. Now, obviously, it looks like it depends only on um, how the planet attracts um, objects on its surface, the free-fall acceleration g, that's the property of the planet, right? On Earth it's 9.8, and it depends on the length of the thread. Nothing more, everything else is dictated by this differential equation. Now, the good news is that we have a second order differential equation, right? Second order because it's a second derivative here. And we have two initial conditions. The initial condition for the function and, if, I, I, and its derivative. And from the theory of, the, uh, uh, theory of differential equations, that should be sufficient to find a solution. Well, that's the good news. Another good news was, by the way, that we have canceled out the mass. So the motion is independent on the mass of the uh, point object at the end of the pendulum. Now let me give you the bad news. The bad news is that we cannot solve this differential equation in uh, simple algebraic functions. You cannot say that some algebraic function phi of t is equal to I don't know, something square, something square root, something multiply, something divided. You cannot express in any kind of a traditional uh, mathematical functions, trigonometric function, exponential function, whatever else you can do, you cannot express your solution in these explicit terms of nice algebraic functions which we uh, get used to. Well, that's quite unfortunate, I would say. So, if we want to know exact solutions to this thing, there is only one way. Use the computers and use some numerical analysis to basically 
uh, plot the function uh, as it goes as a, as a function of t. So for every specific uh, t, uh, time t, we can find the value of this function, but we cannot express it um, on the computer, but we cannot express it in any kind of a nice algebraic formula. Well, you might say that you are surprised that there is something which we cannot really express in normal mathematical terms. Well, don't be surprised. I would say that majority of the things which are really happening in the nature are much beyond uh, in their complexity to abilities of mass to nicely express it. Well, say thanks that we have a, a differential equation and we have certain numerical procedures using computers to basically calculate the function uh, phi of t for any uh, specific uh, time. Um, but as far as expressing it in some nice way, probably most of the really occurring in nature uh, things are not that simple. Uh, the law of gravitation is uh, approximation. Uh, the second law uh, of Newton is approximate. Everything is approximation to a certain degree. And even such a simple mechanical device as ideal pendulum, and I'm talking about ideal pendulum, which, uh, which uh, the thread is not stretchable, you know, this type of thing. Our object is a point object, so it doesn't have any, any dimensions. Even in this ideal case, so-called mathematical pendulum, even here we have uh, an equation which cannot be solved. However, uh, what we can do, we can approximate the solution of this differential equation with another differential equation which is well kind of uh, close to this one and we can solve it and that's actually what I'm going to do right now here is my point now um, if you went through a um, course of mathematics especially if the one which presented on unisor.com mass for teens uh, you uh, must be familiar with this particular limit. So, if you have graphics, this is sine, and this is y is equal to x. So here, they are very, very close to each other. So if my angle is in relative proximity to zero if it's a small angle, so to speak. For small angle, the difference between sine x and x is very, very small. It's non-existent. I mean, it exists, but it's so small that we can really kind of ignore it. And instead of um, using the sine of something, of an angle, we can use the angle itself. Now, obvious question is what exactly are the boundaries of closeness which we which we can really feel comfortable about if we replace sign of something with that something itself well traditionally we are saying something like uh, from minus 15 degree to plus 15 degree then this interval it's really um, allowed to have sine uh, of the angle to be replaced with an angle itself without much, um, without much difference, actually. Which means that if our initial um, phi zero, if our initial tilt is really not a big one, it's not like 45 degrees, but something like 15 degrees, if our, so this is 45 degrees approximately, right? Now, 15 should be one third of it, something like this. So if we just a little bit tilt the pendulum in the very beginning and then let it go, then probably this particular type of motion can be approximated with replacing this differential equation with this one. So I replace sine of phi of t with phi of t itself. Now this is much simpler differential equation. 
This is the differential equation we can actually solve without any problems. And again, during um, the course of mass 14, I did consider something like this as an example of differential linear differential linear differential equation of the second order, which can be solved. So right now, I'm not going into the details of how to solve it. I'll just put down a solution. Solution is phi of t is equal to c1 cosine square root of g over l t plus c2 sine of square root of g over l t. This is a general solution of this uh, equation. Let's just verify that this is true. The first derivative of this would be c1. Derivative of cosine is a sine of square root of g over l t times uh, the inner function, which is just a multiplication by a constant, should be differentiated. And the, uh, the derivative is square root of g over l plus c2. Derivative of sine is a cosine of this times derivative of inner function, which is again square root of g over l. That's my first derivative. Now, my, my second derivative, so this is first. My second derivative is, well, this is a constant, this is a constant. So we have c1 times square root of g over l is a constant. Um, uh, I think I made a mistake. Now, this should be with a minus sign. Sorry. Minus C1 times. Uh, derivative of cosine minus sine, not sine. Derivative of sine, cosine. That's okay. So we still have a minus here. I see something is wrong. Um, times uh, derivative of sine, which is a cosine of square root of g over lt times uh, derivative of the inner function, which is also square root of g over uh, l. And we have already square root of g over, over l. So if I will multiply, I will just get rid of the square root. Um, then this one, uh, derivative of cosine minus sine, so it's a C2, uh, this constant, square root of g over L, of s uh, cosine would be minus uh, sine, so minus here, sine here, uh, square root of g over L, uh, T, And uh, in the uh, function, uh, it's the square root of g over l, and I will get rid of this. Now, what we have, the second derivative is equal to this. And how is this compared with this? That's exactly the same thing, you see? Minus g over l minus g over l minus g over l multiplied by c1 cosine plus uh, c2 sine, which is exactly our function 5t. So this is a solution. Great. And again, I did not want to get inside of how I obtained this solution. If you are interested, um, I suggest you to go to any uh, textbook on differential equation or to the course Mass 14's differential equation chapter where I discuss this. So this is the solution, proved it. Now, what are C1 and C2? Well, we have initial conditions which will help us. So if I will substitute zero instead of T, I should have phi zero. Now I substitute zero here, that would be sine of zero, which is zero. And now it's, if I will substitute this zero, it will be cosine of zero, which is one times C1, so it's C1 is equal to phi zero. Now, the first derivative uh, 
I wiped it out, but I can just write it again. C1 is equal to phi 0. Now my first derivative is equal to minus C1 square root of G over L sine of square root of G over L T plus C2 cosine square root of G over L cosine square root of g over l t. That's my first derivative, right? And if I substitute t is equal to 0 into first derivative, this will be sine of 0, which is 0. This will be cosine, which is, uh, which is 1. So I will have c2 times this square root is equal to 0, so C2 is equal to 0. So we found a particular solution, not just a general solution, which is this one, but a particular solution which satisfies our initial condition. C1, which is phi 0, cosine square root of G over L times T, and C2 is equal to 0. So this is a solution, this is how our pendulum would actually oscillate. This is the, as the, this is the dependency of the angle of tilting from the vertical um, as a function of time. But again, don't forget that this is only within certain very um, small angles. So our initial phi zero, our initial tilting should not be really very big. As I said, no more than like 10, 15 uh, degrees, which is relatively small. Then this is true. On a bigger angle, it's not working. So whenever you're presented, whenever you're presented with the problem about pendulum and they're saying use the formula, whatever the formula is uh, for pendulum oscillation like this one, you have to understand that, well, it's working more or less well within only um, certain restrictions on the initial angle not to be um, too big. Now, our problem can be formulated differently. For instance, instead of tilting at some initial angle phi zero and then let it go, and then it goes by itself, we can impose different initial conditions. For instance, the pendulum is hanging vertically and we just push it give him some initial uh, speed along the trajectory so this would be zero and this would be some constant and that would result in different c1 and c2 it will be, will be different um, different law but it will still be some um, trigonometric style um, if uh, this is equal to zero it means that uh, C1 should be equal to 0, right? And if this is equal to some constant, then C2 would be equal to something. So it will be um, uh, some coefficient times sine of this particular expression. So just different variations of this general uh, solution to uh, 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 cater to particular initial conditions of, uh, of, of our pendulum. And finally, I would like to basically say a couple of words um, at, at this. Now, this is the cosine, right? It's a very um, kind of uh, well-established trigonometric function. We know all, all, all about it, etc. Uh, cosine is from minus 1 to 1, but if multiplied by phi 0, it will be from minus phi 0 to plus phi 0, right? So uh, phi, phi, phi 0 is, is, is an amplitude. Um, now, how about the period? Now, period is very important for a pendulum because the period is something which we always talk about. What is the period of oscillation of this um, pendulum? Because the pendulum is uh, used, for instance, in the clock, right? Old clocks, uh, grandfather's clocks, right? There was a pendulum. Uh, now, it's very easy. Now, we know from the theory of um, trigonometric functions 
that if you will multiply argument by some uh, multiplier, then the period will diminish. So from 2 pi, it will be 2 pi divided by this particular coefficient or multiplied by its reciprocal. So this would be a period. This is obvious from um, the function, fr from the uh, an uh, analysis of the function cosine. So again, if you multiply a periodic function like cosine by some constant, then obviously the period will be diminished by this constant, or I will multiply by its reverse. <coughs> and, and this is the formula which is given to uh, students in, in many uh, textbooks and websites, etc. Well, just know that this formula is very approximate. It's based on the solution, on a simplified solution um, of our initial differential equation. So it's true only for very small uh, oscillations around the vertical. Well, that's basically it. That's all I wanted to talk about. And um, again, I would like to point out that the nature, even in such simple devices as this pendulum, is very complicated. And uh, it's so complicated that even uh, all the contemporary mathematical um, uh, functions which we are typically familiar with cannot cover such a um, simple motion as oscillation of, of the pendulum. So just have an appreciation to nature in this case. And, uh, and realize that our knowledge is really kind of restricted, let's put it this way. Although we do have certain ways to analyze something which is not really algebraically well um, expressible, uh, we have this power of computers and we can probably solve this particular differential equation numerically, which means this function will be numerically evaluated for every moment of time t we can find its value again to a certain degree of approximation. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I do suggest you to go to the website and um, just read the notes to this lecture. I think it's very helpful. Thanks and good luck.